Welcome everyone to our Paschal Eucharist celebration taking place during our solemn mass. To all our new Catholics, I wish to welcome you. Thank you for being here. And I wish to inform you that as soon as the mass finishes, there'll be an unveiling of a very special image of St. Joseph commissioned work by the Archdiocese, which you are more than welcome to attend. Thereafter, we'll be moving towards those who are here for the Paschal Eucharist celebration, that is the new Catholics and their coordinators We'll be moving towards the Cathedral College Hall, which will be just that direction in case you're wondering where it is. So just next to the Cathedral, down the steps towards there. Thank you. God bless.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. Welcome to St. Mary's Basilica in Sydney for the Solemn Mass of the third Sunday of Easter. This morning we greet the risen Lord of Easter with great joy. We also greet with delight our neophytes who were elected for baptism here at the beginning of Lent and were baptised into the family of God in their parishes at Easter, together with all who were received into full communion with the Catholic Church. We welcome you back today, no longer as Christians elect, but as fully fledged brothers and sisters in Christ, acknowledging our communion as one spiritual family. We give thanks for your journey to Easter 2022 and for all of those who had a hand in preparing you along the way. In celebrating with me today, our Auxiliary Bishop of Sydney, Bishop Richard Umbers, Dean Don Richardson, Father Danai and Father Dominic. I welcome Sally Ryan and her husband Michael who are with us today. Sally is the artist who has skillfully painted our new image of St Joseph for our cathedral that will be unveiled and blessed for veneration after Mass. To everyone here this morning, including visitors and more regulars, a very warm welcome to you all. Dear brothers and sisters, let us humbly beseech the Lord our God to bless this water he has created, which will be sprinkled on us as a memorial of our baptism. May he help us by his grace to remain faithful to the spirit we have received. Lord our God, in your mercy, be present to your people's prayers. And for us who recall the wondrous work of our creation and still greater work of our redemption, graciously bless this water. For you created water to make the fields fruitful and to refresh and cleanse our bodies. You also made water the instrument of your mercy, for through water you freed your people from slavery and quenched their thirst in the desert. Through water the prophets proclaimed the new covenant you were to enter upon with the human race. And last of all, through water, which Christ made holy in the Jordan, you have renewed our corrupted nature in the bath of regeneration. Therefore, may this water be for us a memorial of the baptism we have received and grant that we may share in the gladness of our brothers and sisters who at Easter have received their baptism. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We humbly ask you, almighty God, be pleased in your faithful love to bless this salt you have created. For it was you who commanded the prophet Elisha to cast salt into water, that impure water might be purified. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that wherever this mixture of salt and water is sprinkled, every attack of the enemy may be repulsed, and your Holy Spirit may be present to keep us safe at all times. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
May Almighty God cleanse us of our sins and through the celebration of this Eucharist, make us worthy to share at the table of his kingdom. Amen. Gloria in excelsis Deo.
Let us pray. May your people exalt forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. First reading, a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The high priest demanded an explanation of the apostles. We gave you a formal warning, he said, not to preach in this name. And what have you done? You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and seem determined to fix the guilt of this man's death on us. In reply, Peter and the apostles said, obedience to God comes before obedience to men. It was the God of our ancestors who raised up Jesus, but it was you who had him executed by hanging on a tree. By his own right hand, God has now raised him up to be leader and savior, to give repentance and forgiveness of sins through him to Israel. We are witnesses to all this, we and the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. They warned the apostles not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them. And so they left the presence of the Sanhedrin, glad to have had the honor of suffering humiliation for the sake of the name. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the book of the Apocalypse. In my vision, I, John, heard the sound of an immense number of angels gathered round the throne and the animals and the elders. 
There were 10,000 times 10,000 of them, and thousands upon thousands shouting, the lamb that was sacrificed is worthy to be given power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Then I heard all the living things in creation, everything that lives in the air and on the ground and under the ground and in the sea, crying to the one who is sitting on the throne and to the Lamb, be all praise, honor, glory and power forever and ever. And the four animals said, Amen. And the elders prostrated themselves to worship. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. It was by the Sea of Tiberias, and it happened like this. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two more of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. They replied, we will come with you. They went out 
and got into the boat but caught nothing that night. It was light by now and there stood Jesus on the shore, though the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus called out, Have you caught anything, friends? And when they answered, No, he said, Throw the net out to starboard, and you will find something. So they dropped the net, and there were so many fish that they could not hold it in. The disciples Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. At these words, it is the Lord, Simon Peter, who had practically nothing on, wrapped his cloak round him and jumped into the water. The other disciples came on in the boat, towing the net and the fish. They were only about a hundred yards from land. As soon as they came ashore, they saw that there was some bread there and a charcoal fire with fish cooking on it. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore full of big fish, 153 of them. And in spite of there being so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples were bold enough to ask, Who are you? They knew quite well it was the Lord. Jesus then stepped forward, took the bread and gave it to them, and the same with the fish. This was the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after rising from the dead. After the meal, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Look after my sheep. Then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was upset that he asked him the third time, Do you love me? And said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. I tell you most solemnly, when you were young, you put on your own belt and walk where you liked. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and somebody else will put a belt round you and take you where you would rather not go. In these words, he indicated the kind of death by which Peter would give glory to God. After this, he said, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
two years before he was catapulted to stardom as Crocodile Dundee. Paul Hogan graced American TV sets with an advertisement for Australian tourism. He demonstrated the cheerful, laid-back demeanour of Aussies while showcasing some of our beautiful landscapes, including Sydney Harbour. Hogan's invitation down under climaxed with a sentence that was cemented into Aussie vernacular and global memory. Holding up a large prawn, he said, I'll slip another shrimp on the barbie for you. Even if he used the American word for prawn, Hogan captured Aussie keenness to share our country, food, and selves with others, and also a love for barbecues. Barbecues go back a long way in this country. For tens of thousands of years, Aboriginal cuisine relied upon open-air cooking on hot coals. Though the European settlers preferred to cook indoors in wood-fired ovens and then on gas or electric stoves, outdoor bullock roasts were held for public events in the 19th century. As early as 1903, the Waverley Bowls Club was advertising an outdoor leg of mutton barbecue. With the rise of home ownership on quarter acre blocks, Australians enjoyed the great outdoors by cooking chops and sausages rather than whole animals on an outdoor grill, accompanied by tomato sauce, beer, or cardboard cask wine. By the 1960s, gas bottle barbies had arrived and the sausage sizzle became our culinary icon. The barbecue caught on because it suited the Australian weather, at least until recently. Because it was versatile, there aren't many things you can't chuck on the barbie. And because it brought people together, whether an extended family around a home grill or strangers around a public one at a park or beach. The smoky food was secondary to the fellowship it occasioned. Jesus loved such fellowship. The Gospels have him regularly eating with newlyweds, Pharisees, undesirables, friends, or even crowds of thousands picnicking on the hills. This was not just at times of leisure. Jesus' most precious mo moments are marked by eating and drinking. His first great sign is turning water into wine. His most recorded is multiplying loaves and fishes. And his last wonder, which we just heard read, is the hall of fish. All three miracles were of end of time proportions, divine in their extravagance. As his ministry came to its climax, he took his closest friends aside for a last meal, transforming the Passover into his own Pasch and perpetuating our participation in it as the Eucharist. Before returning to the Father, he dined again with despairing disciples in Emmaus, with confused ones in the Cenacle, and today with excited ones at the Lakeside Barbie. And all of this partying, replete with spiritual significance, 
came very naturally to a man who loved people and who loved to party. Jesus also loved food and wine. This particular aspect of his temperament coloured his theology and preaching. Rather than a patristic theologian, scholastic theologian, liberation or eco-theologian, you might say he was a culinary theologian. The Gospels read as a veritable cookbook. They are replete with talk of vineyards, grapes, wine, spirits and vinegar, of wheat, flour, barley, yeast and bread, of fruit trees, olives, figs, mulberries and more, of eggs, pigeons, fish, lamb, pig, goat and a fatted calf, of salt, honey, mustard, herbs and spices. Jesus described prayer as asking our Father for our daily bread and forgiveness as a father feasting his prodigal son's return. Christian life is bearing fruit and yielding a harvest. Preaching should be savoury and Christian leaders wise stewards feeding their charges at the proper time. The kingdom of God is like a wedding party, he said, and in that kingdom, Jesus' disciples will eat and drink at his table. How does Jesus describe himself? My food is to do the will of my Father. I am the bread of life. And how does he leave himself to us? again as food, his body and blood under the appearances, the staple foods of bread and wine. Jesus is remembered in the meal, substantial in the food and drink. Some didn't approve. John the Baptist's disciples expected more asceticism. Jesus' critics called him glutton and drunkard. Well, why all this foodie stuff in the Gospels? Well, one thing it reminds us of is that though divine, though glorified, the risen Jesus was the same man as he was pre-Easter. And the best way to prove to us that he was no ghost was to eat with us. This is the God-man whose incarnation shows the goodness of our physical natures and their potential, whose living and dying alongside us shows he loves human companionship and sympathises with our lot, whose leaving us the Eucharist shows he still wants to party with us. Jesus' attitudes to food and friendship infected his disciples. On Easter Sunday, we saw that John, the younger disciple, was faster running to the tomb. Today, he has better eyes for seeing distant shores and first identifies Jesus. Peter was slower getting there. But when he smelt Jesus' fish burgers, he was so excited, we're told he leapt ashore, almost forgetting to put his clothes on. When the others arrive, Jesus says, I'll slip another shrimp on the barbie for you. With 153 fish between them, like after any Middle Eastern feast, we can safely assume no one went home hungry. Jesus loved to party. 
but those parties were always occasions for some deep conversation, profound learning, miraculous grace. At the beachside barbie today, Peter's three Good Friday denials were reversed with three protestations of love. His previous calls to be a follower disciple of Jesus, a fisher evangelist of men, a rock solid security man for the church, a key holder for heaven, are all reprised in his new call to be a shepherd. Jesus underlines the responsibility of the pastor and again he uses foodie language. Peter must feed young and old, sheep and lambs, feed minds and hearts. And to cap it all off, amidst the intimacy of the meal, Jesus tells him, tells us, what Christian friendship and pastoral service will cost. Being ready to lay down our lives for each other. Christian love is cross and resurrection love. The paradoxical self-giving that regains itself for keeps. Jesus' great mate Peter is told that he'll be led where he'd rather not go. But his death will give glory to God and so to Peter also. The Easter church has begun and with it the companionship of the disciples, the witness of the martyrs and the celebration of the sacraments. It is into this Christ's death and resurrection that you were grafted, dear neophytes, by your baptism at Easter. It is into this church that you were incorporated by your confirmation. And it is with this eternal banquet that our new Catholics commune now in Holy Communion. Welcome to the before party. Look forward to the heavenly banquet to come. Together we profess our faith in the one who rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God allows us to experience emptiness that we may be filled with his love. Let us entrust our petitions to the risen Christ, who gives us all that we need. For Pope Francis, Archbishop Anthony, his assistant bishops, Terry, Richard and Danny, and all the priests and deacons of the Catholic Church, that their love for the risen Lord will strengthen them to feed their sheep. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all leaders and people in positions of authority, that they would not seek to silence those who teach and preach in the name of Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of our brothers and sisters who are in need, that we may help to feed them in body and spirit, sharing with them Christian hospitality and prayers. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of our neophytes gathering here today, and for all new Catholics spread throughout the world, that each of us who have been baptised will forever recognise the real presence of the risen Lord and the communion we share with God in the Eucharist. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For workers and for all those responsible for creating and securing employment opportunities, that inspired by St. Joseph, they would act with humble trust in God's plans and conduct themselves with unwavering care for those entrusted to them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have gone before us, that the risen Christ may welcome them on the shore of eternity to the eternal banquet in heaven. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty Father, we love you and we trust you. Hear and answer these prayers, which we humbly make to you through your Son, our risen Lord, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive, O Lord, we pray, these offerings of your exultant Church, and as you have given her cause for such great gladness, grant also that the gifts we bring may bear fruit in perpetual happiness, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But in this time above all, to lord you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. He never ceases to offer himself for us, but defends us and even pleads our cause before you. He is a sacrificial victim who dies no more, the Lamb once slain who, who lives forever. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people, exalts in your praise. And even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant, Terry, Richard, and Danny, my assistant bishops, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise that they offered for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being and paying the homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, 
Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cordelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord. We, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the Just the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember, Lord, also your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Martellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, 
O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. As we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Look with kindness upon your people, O Lord, and grant, we pray, that those you were pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection. Through Christ our Lord. Dear neophytes and all our newest Catholic Christians, welcome brothers and sisters. It's been a privilege for all of us to witness a defining moment in your lives on earth and the life to come. Above all, of course, we give thanks to Christ, to whose life, death and resurrection you have been joined and whose identity and destiny is now yours forever. Keep proclaiming him just as the disciples continue to proclaim him, even in the face of trials and tribulations. You're now part of a spiritual body that consists of 1.2 billion people right now, a body that reach back, reaches back to the apostolic period and forward into eternity. I encourage you to keep learning about Christ, studying your faith, asking your questions, and contemplating the mysteries. Be zealous in sharing that faith with others through evangelization and service. To that end, I'm delighted to launch the Catholic Mass booklet that each of you will receive in your goodies bag after Mass. This resource, while quite small, is packed full of richness. It's been produced by the Sydney Centre for Evangelization as a tool that will help you unpack the beauty of the Mass. You'll find information on each part of the Mass and it draws upon the deep wells of our faith, including sacred scripture, sacred tradition, sacred art, and the wisdom of the saints. I pray that this will assist your active participation in the sacred liturgy. Congratulations, newest Christians and newest Catholics. Welcome to the family of God God bless you always. Immediately following Mass today, the procession will move to the Chapel of St. Joseph for the unveiling and blessing of a beautiful new painting in honour of the saint whose feast is ordinarily celebrated today. I welcome those of you who can join us and encourage everyone to make a visit when you can, to go to St. Joseph and to implore his prayers and powerful intercession for your families and for the church. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May God, who by the resurrection of his only begotten Son was pleased to confer on you the gift of redemption and of adoption, give you gladness by his blessing. Amen. Amen. May he, by whose redeeming work you have received the gift of everlasting freedom, make you heirs to an eternal inheritance. Amen. Amen. And may you who have already risen with Christ in baptism through faith, by living in a right manner on this earth, be united with him in the homeland of heaven. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go forth, the mass is ended. Thanks be to God.
in a few moments this splendid new painting depicting Saint Joseph as the loving spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the devoted guardian and legal father of her divine son, our Lord Jesus Christ, will be unveiled and blessed. Made possible by a generous donation from someone who wishes to remain anonymous, this sacred art commemorates the recent year of Saint Joseph, which was decreed by Pope Francis and which ran from the 8th of December 2020 to the 8th of December 2021, a period, as we all know very well, was significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and the second wave of lockdowns. In his apostolic letter, Patris Corde, establishing the year of St. Joseph, which marked the 150th anniversary of the declaration of St. Joseph as patron of the Universal Church by Blessed Pius IX, Pope Francis referred to the pandemic, noting that it has helped us see more clearly the importance of ordinary people who, though far from the limelight, exercise patience and offer hope every day. In this, he said, they resemble Saint Joseph, the man who goes unnoticed, a daily, discreet and hidden presence, who nonetheless played an incomparable role in the history of salvation. The Pope explained that Saint Joseph concretely expressed his fatherhood by making an offering of himself in love, a love placed at the service of the Messiah who was growing to maturity in his home. Pope Francis highlighted several characteristics of Saint Joseph which may serve as a model and inspiration for fathers, spouses and families today. He spoke of Joseph as a beloved father, he has always been venerated as a father by the Christian people, a tender and loving father. In St. Joseph, Jesus himself saw the tender love of God. An obedient father, obedient to the will of God, attuned to God through prayer and respect, and even in adversity, faithful to that divine will. An accepting father, meaning that Joseph accepted Mary, trusted in the angel's words about her and her son, and followed the spiritual path laid before him, not with passive resignation, but courageously and actively. A creatively courageous father, a working father, and what the Pope calls a father in the shadows, meaning that being a father entails introducing children to life and reality, not holding them back, being overprotective or possessive, but rather making them capable of deciding for themselves, enjoying freedom and exploring new possibilities. All this God entrusted St. Joseph to do for Jesus. These characteristics of St. Joseph are, I believe, beautifully and skillfully captured in this new painting, the fruit of much consideration by the artist commissioned to create it, Sally Ryan. Sally carefully listened to our aspirations for this sacred art, and in her composition and working of the painting, both overall and in the detail, has captured the very qualities of St. Joseph as guardian and guide that Pope Francis contemplated in Patris Corday. Our original aspiration had been to have an artwork completed by the end of 2021, but the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns meant that the process of the commission was slowed down. It was not until November last year that the artist could finally have models sitting for the work. 
but the time before that was well spent with, for example, a number of studies painted to explore the composition and the relationship between the figures, which was something we considered an important part of the special character of this painting as a commemoration of the year of St. Joseph. The completed painting captures the Holy Family resting briefly while on a journey. We may consider it to be as they travel back from Egypt to Nazareth. The image is characterized, I'm whetting your appetite for it as I speak. The image is characterized by realism but also has important symbolic elements not only in the particular colours which adorn each of the persons, but also in the inclusion of certain botanical elements with lilies and flowering plants known as the crown of thorns and the star of Bethlehem. Hence, this new painting taps into the long traditions of sacred and devotional art and spirituality. Quite recently, speaking to a group, of a group dedicated to supporting artists and sacred art, architecture, poetry, and music, Pope Francis said, in the difficult current context that the world is experiencing, in which sadness and distress sometimes seem to have the upper hand, your mission is more necessary than ever because beauty is always a source of joy putting us in touch with divine goodness. As St. John Paul II wrote in his letter to artists in 1999, the church needs art in order, I quote, to communicate the message entrusted to her by Christ, the church needs art. Art must make perceptible and as far as possible attractive, the world of the spirit, of the invisible, of God. It must therefore translate into meaningful terms that which is in itself ineffable. Art has a unique capacity to take one or other facet of the message and translate it into colors, shapes and sounds which nourish the intuition of those who look or listen. It does so without emptying the message itself of its transcendent value and its aura of mystery." End of the quote. Here in St. Mary's Cathedral, we now have another example of this sacred art, which indeed the church needs. Placed here close by the altar of St. Joseph, with its superb sculpture of the death of St. Joseph and the luminous stained glass depiction of the betrothal of Mary and the Holy Family at home in Nazareth. May this painting become a true focal point of devotion to St. Joseph, a place where fathers and families will come to pray and seek encouragement, guidance and guardianship from him whom the Gospels call a righteous man. On behalf of His Grace, of the Cathedral Administration, of the Archdiocese and Marriage, Life and Family Office, of the Benefactor, who remains unknown to me, and I confidently add on behalf of everyone here waiting with great anticipation to behold it, I express to you, Sally, most sincere gratitude for this new painting. Catholics have long had a motto, Ite ad Yosef, go to Joseph. I'm sure many will find their way to him here.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the crowning glory of all the saints, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My brothers and sisters, as we begin to celebrate this rite in praise of God on the occasion of the unveiling of this beautiful new image of St. Joseph for public veneration, we must be properly disposed and have a clear appreciation of the meaning of this celebration. When the church blesses a picture or statue that present and presents it for public veneration of the faithful, it does so for the following reasons. That when we look at the representation of those who have followed Christ faithfully, we will be motivated to seek the city that is to come. That we will learn the way that will enable us most surely to attain complete union with Christ that as we struggle along with our earthly concerns, we will be mindful of the saints, those friends and co-heirs of Christ, who are also our brothers and sisters and our special benefactors, that we will remember how they love us, are near us, intercede ceaselessly for us, and are joined to us in marvellous communion. This is how Jesus Christ came to be born. His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they came to live together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a man of honor and wanting to spare her publicity, decided to divorce her informally. He made up his mind to do this when the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because she has conceived what is in her by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you must name him Jesus, because he is the one who is to save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill the words spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord told him to do. He took his wife to his home and though he had had no intercourse with her, she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord, we bless you, for you alone are holy, 
And because of your compassion for sinners, you sent into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of holiness. He sent the Spirit to sustain his newborn church, a voice that teaches us the secrets of holiness, a breeze that strengthens and refreshes, a fire that sears our hearts in love, the seed of God that yields a harvest of grace. Today we praise you for the gifts of the Spirit bestowed on St. Joseph, in whose honour we dedicate this image. May we follow in the footsteps of the Lord, keeping before us the example of St. Joseph, and grow to a maturity measured not by nature, but by the fullness of Christ. May we proclaim his gospel by word and deed, and shouldering our crosses daily, expend ourselves for others in your service. As we carry out our earthly duties, may we be filled with the Spirit of Christ and keep our eyes fixed on the glories of heaven, where you, Father, receive those who will reign with your Son for ever and ever. God, the crowning glory and joy of all his saints, has graciously given you the gift of their patronage. May he continue to bestow his blessing upon you. Amen. Amen. Delivered from present evils by the intercession of the saints and guided by the example of their holy lives, may you be found always ready to serve God and your neighbour. The church rejoices in serenity that you, sons and daughters of the church, are destined to join the saints in heaven and to share their unending happiness. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.